I'd be happy to facilitate next week, though. Give me a second. All right, hi everybody. Welcome to the May 18th Chaos uh, Community Call. If you could add yourself to the minutes, that would be great. And tell us how you're doing today or the last year you wrote a check. Somebody put that in there. I'm not sure. That was that, that when I was getting ready for, to facilitate the uh, I put a, put in a question. Um, I'll share my screen. All right. Well, uh, welcome. Um, have a few things on the agenda today. If, if you'd like to add anything, uh, please feel free to add stuff to the agenda. Um, I had added a few things, and we can talk about those as we go forward. All right. Um, the first thing is open issues and PRs. So let's go ahead and take a look at those. Um, we do have a, a whole kind of variety of open uh, PRs that it would, some of these like the 440 and 439, 437, these are in responses to some of the open issues <clears throat> that we have. So this is about metric revision. And so, for example, opening the issue here around time inclusion for virtual events, event demographics, family friendliness, and code of conduct. So there were issues that were opened here that kind of highlight specific things to take care of. And these pull requests, so let's see, what do we got here? Code of conduct, okay, so a couple of these I'm not sure are completely appropriate. Um, so time inclusion for virtual, or at least they're out of order. I don't know what people's thoughts are. So we have these four. Somebody could kind of memorize those. And then we have these pull requests. So like sponsorship was not a metric that had an issue associated with it. See what I'm saying? Anybody following? Yes. What I'm about here? Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm following. Is it a new metric? No, sponsorship is an existing metric. Okay. I think, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I think the, the person making the edits got a little carried away. Uh, so ra rather than just <laughs> reviewing the metrics that have been identified so far for review, uh, they were they were going through and uh, kind of making copy edits to uh, multiple metrics. I think uh, I think the the ones that uh, the ones that have been done that aren't part of the review, for the most part, I think those are just copy edits. And maybe we okay. maybe we just accept them if they look okay. Like the these current pull requests are just copy edits. Yeah, I, I believe those are just copy okay. edits. But then we these don't okay. I get what you're saying. So I mean, so we could, we could probably just accept them as outside of the the process. The review of, process. Yeah. Okay. I I, th I think he's most. Uh, I think they're just mostly fixing links that, okay. are, that are broken, which is a very desirable thing for us to to have done. Okay. Um, do you, Kevin, could you kind of go through them really quickly? If they are just copy edits? Yeah. While yeah, we're just that. sitting on this call, right? You know what I mean? Like, um, oh, right now. Yep. Yeah. I mean, okay. If they're just, if they're just links, then I don't, I don't know that I want to like share my screen, copying and pasting links. That's all. It's, okay. It's not, not very exciting to watch. Um, and then 
time inclusion for virtual events. So, s s uh, if you're doing that too, I don't know if you're still listening, Kevin, but like, are all of these, like some of these are more focused on the issue. Yeah, time, time inclusion is one that was part of the, uh, the review okay. revision, I believe. Yeah. And I, I actually believe that one is assigned to me uh, to go through. Uh, okay. There was some, uh, in our last oh, this part. meeting, yeah, yeah, yeah that we discussed, yeah. discussed yeah. that bit. And I, I, uh, I volunteered to take care of that. So okay, okay gotcha. uh, I'm going to spend some time this week jumping through this, uh, that one, and also uh, some of the common and value metrics. So OK. No and then I think family friendliness is another one that's related to an existing metric. Yeah, yes, and that's one that I have in my wheelhouse. I think I signed up for it anyway, following our yeah. sign up for a protocol. I don't know that we have it, but if you want, yeah, if you want to take a look at how that's how those two are related, that would be good. So Kevin. Yeah, because I think what we did in one of the meetings I coordinated is we had people start to sign up for um, just put their names by ones they were going to work on. And I put my name by that family friendly one. OK, so, the, not... so you, you kind of follow what we're talking about here. Like the issue has been opened mm -hmm. on family friendliness. And these are the yes. things that I had kind of identified. Yep. And I need to just do those things. Um, no, they're already done. Oh, so, so Tejas mate had done some of these. I see. And so there was a proposal kind of against that issue, a pull request against that issue. So if you could take a look at if you think the, the pull, pull request, to, got it. If the now pull request following. kind of helps resolve the things in the issue. And if it does, then go ahead and merge it. Got it. But it addresses two metrics, so I'll make a comment, and then when Kevin looks at the other one, he can make a comment. And we both, if they both look good, then we can merge it. I think is what you're saying. There's two different PRs, so I don't know if you can see my. Okay. Screen. So there's a PR for yeah, time yeah. Using for virtual events. I see. And a PR I see. for yep. friendliness. Got it. And so then it does look like the ones that are called revised metric; those are those have an associated issue. Kevin, to your point, the ones that are just called update are yep. just the, like the links and maybe some typos. Yep. And I'm just, I'm checking those right now and I am just okay. going to merge them as I go. Okay. Uh, are you looking at, I'm looking at family friendliness. Are you also looking at family friendliness? I am merging update documentation accessibility right now. So there were these three at the top that were just typos and kevin's just merging these three okay i will not family friendliness does look good to me as well okay so i'll let kevin merge it though so we don't get confused oh you can merge family friendliness okay yeah kevin's not touching family friendliness i hear a bunch of mine right. coming across on my phone i'm guessing ding, ding. Sorry. exactly Okay. So then one more step on this. Kevin and Sean, when you are merging family friendliness and you are Close merging the issue. Well, no, update the issue. So the issue has checkboxes. I see. See what I'm saying? Got it. So just keep the issue open because we need to track this as part of the next release. Make sure you make sure you reference the issue in the uh, in the pull request as well. So they're so they're linked in that way. 
if they're not already linked? They should be linked. I think both of those PRs um, had a link to the issue. Do you want to link the, do you want to add the PR link in the issue as well, Kevin? Yeah, in fact, when you link, tell you what would ha what happens is when you link the PR in the issue, it closes the issue. I'm just going to let you know that. Do you want me to reopen that issue? Please keep the issue open. Yeah. If you, yeah. Yeah. So when you, when you link the issue, which makes a lot of sense, it automatically closes the issue, which oh, yeah. so no. I'll, just, I'll, yeah. I'll reopen. That. Yep. Uh, yeah, that's 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 a formal a formal link. You can just you can just mention the issue in a comment, and then the two will be the two will be tied together as well. Okay. Uh, however, that that will not do a that'll not force close one of the uh, the issue in the yeah. And then, Kevin, this is all just kind of process. If you you're working on code of conduct at event. If you think it's done, you know what I mean? Like if you think the PR addresses everything that was identified in the issue, should we like remove these tags, you think? Uh, I'm working for on time inclusion for virtual events. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm sorry. Time inclusion for virtual events. Should we remove these tags? Uh, at least the good first issue and the help wanted just so that yeah, it's okay. not, we're not, uh, I agree. I think revising metric is useful to keep on there just okay. because for net, for our own recollections of things. Okay. So then do that too. Okay, cool. Thank you, Sean. And thank you, Kevin. Okay. Um, is there anything else on that? I think those are our main issues and pull requests at the moment. Okay. If you refresh now, it should just be the family friendliness is just revising metric. Time and inclusion, you still have to pull off the. Uh... Oh, and then here, yeah. Just the PRs are all good now. I'm changing the title of the update event code of conduct metric uh, so that it matches the other. Okay. Uh, and I should say uh, the update event code of conduct metric. I did actually make that pull request. Uh, but the uh, the purpose of that pull request was not for the revision. That was when I was troubleshooting the uh, uh, the markdown lists bug. Okay. So uh, since I've made the pull request, I suppose I could assign myself that one as well, since I've already started it. And that is this one, code of conduct at event. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, maybe I'll, I'll just add that to my list and set already. Okay. Done that. Okay. Um, great. Thank you. And then Kevin, one last note. I'm sorry. Should we add this to the release notes? Uh, no, no. So uh, metric revisions like this, if they are just uh, copy edits, if there's no, mm -hmm. if there's no. Uh, Kind of substantial changes to the metrics uh, we we had discussed that we were going to exclude those from the release process so okay. this is just uh this is just kind of maintenance uh if we if we are making considerable like substantial changes to what a metric is okay then we do need to take that metric and actually run it back through the release process okay and if we do that then we do want to uh add it to the release notes and create a release issue for it. Uh, okay. But if we're just doing copy edits and fixing some of the language so that it's it's current, and uh, then then we don't need to because the the assumption is that every metric every metric we've released so far is going to go through this treatment. So okay, 
So then in that regard, like if I stick it time inclusion for virtual events, you know what I mean? Like the one you were working on? Uh -huh. Should should we then just ultimately close this issue? Uh, as long as we are tracking it somewhere, and I'm assuming we can track that better in the uh, spreadsheet. Uh, the spreadsheet, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, so then we should close the issue. Yeah, I mean we can always reopen or sort by closed, so it's not like okay. the it's not like this will go away, right? Okay. Uh, so then if I was to come here. So then if I was to come here, DEI, so time inclusion for virtual events. Would we just up, like bump this version up like to 1.1 1 .1 or something? I think you were going to add a column. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> is, did you did you add the column here or was uh, it Yeah, and then it it deleted itself. Okay. I did it. I'm just <laughs> I did not. Uh and I, I think that column was gonna have a was it maybe a date of last review. Wow. Okay. I just do that right now. Uh so in in the so uh, yeah, so a, a date of a date of last review. That way, in the future, we can go through and kind of have a, a process for revisiting metrics that have uh, reached kind of a staleness date. Okay. Okay. So then, time inclusion for virtual events. If you are done today, we would just say May, whatever, whatever the proper format is. I, I left March 10th as the last date of review for family friendliness. That, Cause that's what was in there. That seemed about right, but. I think you should do it, it for today. Yeah, okay. Should, so uh, yeah, the day you, the day you push it. All right, I can fix that really quick. I like that, Kevin. Yeah, yeah, and and then I think at at some point we can we can figure out a way to uh, uh, after a met if if a metric hasn't been looked at in two years, for example, we could consider it stale, okay. and we can we can revisit it and go through this kind of this review process again, where we we go through it and we do copy edits, we make sure the links work, okay. and we decide at that point if we want to do a more substantial edit, which would send that metric back into review. Okay, that makes sense. Cool. Oops. Okay. Is that the best date format? It's not bad, is it? Uh, works for me. It's backwards for the Europeans. <laughs> no. All right, well, we'll keep it here until otherwise, until told otherwise. Okay. All right. So then kind yes. of here. Not that one. So Kevin, you would close this issue at that point, right? Did you? Yeah, don't, you don't just, close it yet. I, I, haven't, I haven't addressed that one. Okay. Uh, the Sean just addressed one of them, right? The yeah, I that. fixed the family friendliness one. That's correct. Okay. Okay, and then the metric revision to release. Yeah, so we should add the the caveat for that add metric release revision. Uh, the the caveat for that adding it to the release notes is we're only doing that if we're sending the metric back into the release process or through the through the right so some of these like what i'm looking at here yeah right oh we do need to do this don't we yes yep so many steps yeah so yeah and the caveat for metric candidate release that so I don't we need to add that we need to add that caveat as well so that's once again, that's only if we're if we've made substantial changes and yeah. need to go back through the the release. So, so, like for this metric, 
family friendliness we would not add i just don't check that you know uh yeah and maybe in the the template that we have maybe we should we should make the language a little clearer yeah for, if you're only doing minor things don't yeah, worry so, about it. so i know this is this, right. this checklist comes from the uh the original release checklist we used so it, it comes from there yeah it's modified yeah. a bit but and and it is it is appropriate uh those check marks are appropriate but only if we're sending it back through the through the review process so it's just a maybe we add a an optional or we add a just okay. a, in parentheses something that says you know if substantial changes have been made okay well that makes sense i can go back through kind of update And that, that template is located in the community repo, correct? Um, no, it's in this repo. Oops, not oh, there. does does it automatically? That's one that automatically populates. Um, what do you mean? Oh, do, you, do you have to select it, or uh... so it's in here? Okay, so when you create when you create an issue that automatically comes up it's a choice yeah as a choice yeah okay yep and so when i make a change here you know i'll have to cascade that change okay excellent yep to all the all the different working groups okay. i'm gonna i'm gonna i'll make a list i'm gonna i'll take a peek at that and just make sure okay yeah if you could take okay. a look at it too that'd be good i know i've looked at it in the past but i always end this stuff Okay, and the reason that it's in each individual working group fold get dot GitHub folder is so that because just because we didn't want these templates across all repositories. You know what I mean? Yep. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay. All right, um, moving along. Thank you for that. Um, I would like to talk just a little bit about project badging. So we're slowly moving this forward. Thanks to Elizabeth for bringing that repository out of the depths. Um, so in the badging repository, we now have event oops, project diversity and inclusion. So this is far from being um, like ready to launch in any way, shape or form. Yeah. But I took a look at what was already existing in there. So Asta had done some work and Matt Cantu had maybe done some work there as well. And um, I took a look at it just kind of this this overview. And I think the same, you know, it's still going to be, I think this will have to change a little bit because we want to um, not have as many levels for project badging. Um, but we have the project submission guidelines, and these are some, oh, wait, not that, sorry. Um, submission requirements, here we go. So these were, this is holding on to some of the stuff that Asta had put in there as well as um, adding some of the new components that we talked about. So um, I'm, I'm curious what people think about, uh, it, kind of imagine yourself having a project submit a request for a chaos badge, all right? And this is around diversity, equity, and inclusion. So we're trying, we're trying to balance um, helping projects better center DEI within their own work, but also understanding that there's 10 million projects out in the world and that we only have so many people who are participating from a badging perspective. <laughs> like we're trying to balance these different, these different things and it's not easy. So if we were to ask people who are applying for a badge that they indicate that they have a license file, that they have a contributing guidelines document, that they have a readme file, and they have a code of conduct file. I'm not 
necessarily advocating for or against any of these. I'm just kind of bringing these forward. So what do people think about this? Well, we had discussed the code of conduct before, and we've mm -hmm. also discussed a DEI.md file. Which I have down here. Okay. Yeah. Yep. These, these actually above here, these were what were kind of left over in the repository. And I'm not sure if maybe um, instead of a README, mm -hmm. because most projects that's kind of expected, maybe to, to maybe have a README that directs to, say like have a readme file that that directs to other um documentation for easy findability or something like that or easy discoverability would be the right word or maybe even a little more specific that that the readme uh gives a a overview or description of what the project is yeah because some some project readme's are fairly uh like you, you go there and I, i'm not sure what this software does yeah this is yes, a project a, <laughs> i need to create a readme file that is a true story i would and maybe contributing guidelines would need to would need to be like a contributing.md file if you're if she has those listed and we had been talking about just looking at the type of and so that we wouldn't um earlier we had discussed like they needed to have these different file types so that we weren't reading every one of them and we were just checking for file exactly. types. yep so if we say the file type instead of contributing information, then we don't have to look through their readme in case they put all their contributing information in their readme. Agreed. Okay. Okay, so like specifically saying, show us your contributing MD file. Yes. Okay. All right, I'm gonna look through and see if OpenStack would actually qualify for any of this because I know we're concentrating on GitHub, GitLab, but there are other communities using other systems. So while we go through this, let me go over. Yeah, that'd be that. good. And if Amy, if it's not like contributing MD, like some other, you know, or similar. Again. We just have so many goddamn repos. <laughs> for the code of, should for the code of conduct file, should we ask that it has a specific name so that we can find it easily if we are just checking? Code of conduct.md. Yeah, I, I agree with that. I think these documents should follow uh, kind of a standard naming convention. Uh, most and most projects do. Uh, follow that standard naming convention. So the I think the expectation from a visitor is that 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 there is a, a readme.md file, for example, or a the the license.md file. So if the if the project isn't following kind of that standard naming protocol, I think that uh it's probably a bad thing. Maybe maybe above the require at the top of requirements. Um you say um turn that like turn the badge we add the, um your files must follow a standard the standard naming conventions of and then then you put the name of the file and what your what the expectation of it is under it. like we have the diversity equity inclusion.md we have contributing.md etc cetera, etc cetera, etc cetera. give what we want them to be called what if someone has put all the contributing information in their readme though they create a contributing.md so that we don't have to go looking for it <laughs> that just says look at the readme yeah because then um well if 
their information is in a contributing.md, that's how people are going to find it because people might browse the README, but they could direct to the contributing.md from the README, but maybe not have all of the information in their README. Yeah, I think if the if this badging is about the best practices, then having a separate uh, contributing.md file is very explicit. And as a new contributor to a project, I can see that document in the file structure and I can go there, even if that document points me to other places. I mean, it is a general expectation of a welcoming project. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so what I'm hearing is that we, and tell me if I'm wrong, that we would have, that we would say in your readme file, because there's an assumption that they're going to have a readme, I don't, like they all do, in your readme file, you really need to have a couple things clearly available in your readme, of which I, includes, oh, go ahead. Uh, I actually, I don't know that those need to be in the readme, but there's these files that we've just described need to be in the file structure of the, the repo, right? If you're, yeah, because if you're in GitLab, I don't know if GitHub does it as well. I believe it does. There's a they button do. right above the readme that says contributing.md and like license. And you can just click on those buttons and it takes you directly to those files. They don't, people don't have to go sifting through the file structure. Okay, so then what does the readme if we if we say we we want to see these contributing md code of conduct.md and this dei.md file what do we need the readme for in this review so i think the the readme provides an overview of what the project is and lets the lets the new user know exactly what the the software does right so i i do think that's important if you if you land on the readme or if you land on this project, you should have a readme that tells you, kind of gives you an overview of what the project is. So you know you're in the right place. You don't want to give a book an award if it doesn't have a cover. Yeah. Essentially. Okay. Is the same principle here. Okay. So then what about a license file? So if, it, if it's an open source project, it needs to have a license file. Otherwise, it's not an open source project. Right. Are we only using um, I for DEI? That doesn't honestly. That doesn't seem like something that. Um, it's not our concern. It's not our concern. I really, yeah, I wouldn't think that needs to be in there for us at least. Uh, so for event badging, it is our concern. So we have a specific question in event badging that is is this is this event an open source event and i feel like um the when kevin and i or when we did that research project that was a reason why people left communities is when the license changed to be more um restrictive so it's it's inclusive in a different lens using a different lens i see so it's not Definitely. about it what it's not about initially it, it being there or not it's about if the license changed or, I think it's, or if I think it's, it's a both. restrictive license that you know severely limits participation um, yeah i do think it's both because we are this is a focus on the the projects that we're badging have to be open source projects so we we have to have that that uh the license in there because the license is the proof uh -huh. that it's an open source project and then to elizabeth's point which is uh, excellent uh is that yes license licenses can restrict accessibility uh and even uh uh Drive how open a project away. is so yeah oh true are there certain licenses that are not allowed in certain countries That's a good question i don't know about countries but definitely companies <laughs> Yeah, I, I know specific, I know very specific licenses that a lot of companies won't even touch. So, so my, my one comment here is we, we can still ask if a project is an open source project without really having a license file, like we can just kind of. Well, but I, but I would say uh, as a user of the software, 
you can't use the software as open source if it doesn't have a license attached to it, right? So the, um, the assumption has to be that it's not open source if there's no license attached to it. So, so that does become an issue of uh, access or usability. I guess that would be our way of making sure that it's open source and that would, so that makes sense. So let me, let me try that again. Um, so like, is part of the, the, the request for a badge, you know, one of the questions that people have to ask is like for events, is this an open source event? And we can, we can take a look at the license file and that's fine. Kevin, I do understand that having a license file is an important indicator as to whether or not a project is open source. Um, I'm also trying to balance the amount of effort that goes in from a reviewer perspective on the number of things that we have to look at from a review perspective so that we can potentially handle a large volume of of requests. So a question would be is, do we trust an applicant in their declaration that it's an open source project? Or do we have to like affirm that declaration? And then the second point is the a change in a license, I think would be very difficult for us to observe in a project. And I'm not sure that we should be looking at the license itself and making an assessment as to how inclusive or not inclusive a project is. I think that'd be pretty hard. So Elizabeth. I, think, uh, I was just gonna say, um, cause we did try to include this as part of our welcomingness metrics model is the license. And I think using that where it says OSI approved license, like there's a list um, you know, and it's not, doesn't look super long, um, but I totally get, get your point. So, I mean, it, it can keep people out. If we're looking at it from that lens, it can be, you know, keep people out and not be as welcoming if it does not have an open license. Um, but if we don't care about that right now, maybe that's something we add in later. Once we kind of get the process down, then maybe we add that in later. I don't know. If it's a peer review process instead of some kind of automated tool, it's pretty easy to look at. Like no more difficult than, than uh, contributing. Okay, so there's there does seem to be a desire to see the license, like actually see the whatever it might be, MIT.md or GPL V3.md, is that correct? Kevin, you seem to want that, Sean. Uh, yeah, and I, I think you can um, you can merge those two bullet points together as well. So you have the, the top one that's the OSI approved license, and then the license MD file. I think you just merge those two together. So yeah, I, I don't have strong feelings, but I'm listening to what Elizabeth and Kevin are saying, and the reason that it's there makes sense to me. Yeah, I'm I'm always just I'm. The only reason I'm pushing back is, and I'm fine with it, but is I'm just trying to always lower the burden on the reviewer, even just looking at one additional thing. It's just one one more thing to do, and that's all. If we, if you make the bullet point um, a license.md file with a OSI and then linked to the OSI approved license, um, that makes the requirement very, very old and I think that that's going to take a lot of burden off of us because if people can't check that box they're going to be like oh we don't qualify okay okay so yeah put it all in the same bullet so people don't have to look at it as much reading I know that's only a little bit of space between them but people are lazy okay okay um all right cool so um thank you this is this is super helpful um, this is, we have, do have this, do you see that? This yeah, I'm is not like, sure what that means. Well, it's like, the, I think it's like the event organizer would be my guess. You know, how we require that for event badges. 
Yeah, I wonder if we could change that to uh, project maintainer or more specifically someone who has kind of administrative privileges on the repo. Because I'm, I'm not sure what a major contributor is. I do like I, I like it in some form, just to make sure that it's not like <laughs> some random person. Yeah, I would yeah. say major contributor is a maintainer, a core, a PTL, someone who's got some control over the repo, not just so they have to yeah. have at least merge permissions. We need to have it so that it's based on a metric because with that wording, major contributor is not necessarily associated with a defined metric like what is a major contributor i mean main main i like amy's suggestion of at least having merge commit privileges because that would indicate the person has a degree of trust how and, do how do we also control the different names and the different type of projects by saying yeah. ability to merge yeah Go ahead, Katie. I didn't mean to stop oh, on you. I'm sorry. Um, I was just wondering on different platforms, are they different naming conventions? Yes. Okay, so a yeah. lot of projects like are on GitHub, they call them maintainers for the people who have plus what we that have merged capabilities. Yeah. Open stack the core reviewers which are, uh, anyone can review, but a core has plus two and can do plus workflow. And that's how we, the workflow is what merges for us. So by saying the ability to merge, I think you're covering all the capability, you know, all the different naming type situations that you would run into. Because either you can merge or you can't merge. It's a line in the sand. So you're saying that if you can merge, you're trusted, you know, you belong in this community to speak for the community or the project, whereas I, anyone can re review on any project anywhere. I would say take out the words board member then, because we would have to go looking for somebody in like other websites, if that's the case. And not all board members can merge. <laughs> right. I mean, a lot of times they're appointed by a company who's contributing sponsorship money, and you don't want them anywhere near your repos. <laughs> Just saying. Just saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a what fair statement. Something like this that we ask that the applicant open an issue. What if we asked the applicant to open an issue in their community that says they're applying for a badge? And then link to the issue to us? Mm -hmm. Just to make sure that they're fully transparent within their community. It depends on their issue bug structure. Or some, some signal, you know what I mean? Maybe not, but it's just a thought. Or maybe even just, and if they can like provide a link to the project's email system as proof as well. Um, a link to a notes document from a publicly published meeting minutes um, where it was discussed. Or a I mean, forum discussion. I'm trying to think of places that aren't using GitHub, and I'm always going to be the naysayer on certain things because of that. <laughs> because some of my projects are in and some of them aren't. So like we use a mix of two different bug tracking systems. In each project, like I could apply for Neutron and Nova would never know that we were applying for Neutron and things like that. Um, by doing something in a notes type system, a lot of them are editable by anyone. So even if someone put the note in an etherpad or in HackMD 
two weeks later, someone could change it. Um, so you want something that's kind of static. An email that could be copied is um, if the project is using eavesdrop, you know, there's a recording of everything they say, you can look at it there. Um, but getting something that is static that everyone can see and that you can see is really going to depend on the different project. If they're in GitHub or GitLab, yeah, I think you can do a discussion. Um, you know, other projects have discords and yeah, things are, you can search back on them. Um, but again, I think you're making a little more work for yourself. So I'm not sure the best way to do it so you're not having to search in a million and one place right. to see things because every project's different. Yep. Every community is different. So maybe it's just a suggestion. We, we highly encourage you to circulate the reality that you're requesting a badge within your community, however appropriate or something like that. Yeah, I'm in like five different open source projects, not even counting all the different ones within right. OpenStack and all of them deal with things differently. HackMD, yeah. Etherpad, mailing list, Discord. No, let's use Discourse. You know, it's all over the place. And because it's open source, people are going to use what works best for them. Right. So maybe just a suggestion. Yeah, we don't want to make more <laughs> okay. for the Reviews. badgers. Yeah, the agreed. Okay. Okay, this is good. Thank you. Um, we're going to run out of time. Um, I'll come back to this next week. And then, Katie, to your point, we had suggested a diversity, equity, and inclusion.md file be made available as well, in addition to maybe I should put it up here. But um, this is the f at least the file at this point. what people's thoughts are on i totally randomly just picked four metrics so essentially we would say if you're going to apply for a badge you have to have a license file you have to have a contributing.md you have to have a code of conduct and you have to have this diversity equity and inclusion.md file somewhere which is really just a commentary on how your community addresses project burnout, inclusive leadership, and we provide links to the metrics, documentation, usability, and issue label inclusivity. Do people have thoughts on this? So just one quick question. Should these four metrics be mandatory for each organization that will apply or they can add other metrics or things that you know, they want to share with us? Yeah, no, that's a good question. I mean, I think it's important, at least from a chaos badging perspective, that we ask them to do metrics that we have published. But it could also be like, you know, three out of six or something like that. You know, not like these four mandatory ones, but some. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay. Yep. I think project burnout is important. Um, then I would, yeah, definitely link to the metrics because if somebody is just clicking through and looking at this, sure. yep. they're going to go, what is the definition of inclusive leadership? Um, and um, totally agree. I, I will do that. And sure. when applying for a badge or when doing something, people are more likely to toss it aside and not come back if they have to do too much out of the way reading. That's when, so like already clicking on the OSI approved um, licenses, that's already taking one point where it takes them away where they might leave an open tab and forget about it. Super good point. And so I don't know if the OSI approved licenses, if it's a short enough list, we can put them in there and then put a link to that if they may that, but I would put definitions to things next to it so people don't necessarily have to, to toggle away. Otherwise you're gonna have 
15 windows, 4,000 tabs in your computer crashing and you're going to lose all of it and they'll never do it. Point well taken. That was me yesterday. <laughs> I am sure I will be getting emails from people going, did you ever get to that? Oh, that was a thing. All right. So. I'll stop here. We're, we're over. Elizabeth, you um, did you want to make a comment on the event today at 12, 12 noon? Yeah, if um, if anyone has interest in becoming one of our badgers for the event badging program, um, there's a quick little info session today at noon, so in about an hour. Um, so feel free to join just at the chaos zoom. You don't have to register or anything like that. Just show up. Say hi. Hi right there. I didn't see that come through, Elizabeth. When did that? Um, yeah, I just um, set it up a couple of weeks ago. Um, yeah, it's on the chaos calendar. So if you're in general, if you're in the Slack and you're in general, you'll see those meeting reminders and um, things come through. So, um, but if you can't make that and you're interested in being a badger, just send me an email, elizabeth at chaos.community and I'm happy to set something up on the side, like 101, no big. This is just for, for new new badgers? Yeah, if you're just interested in, in um, becoming a badger, yeah. Okay. Do you have this set up at noon central? Yes. Okay. And then Elizabeth, did you add the hybrid event comment here? I did not. I did. Oh, hi, Ruth. Yeah, hi. So um, with the last um, application we had, uh, the applicant asked about, so it's a hybrid event. I know we have like, separate forms for like in-person and virtual events, but the organizer asked about hybrid events. And then I realized that we just have like forms for in-person and virtual and not like, there's no form for like a hybrid event. So I was thinking if we need to have something like that, because I think these days I see a lot of hybrid events. so. Agreed. My, yeah, my thoughts would be having something combined with like, which I think, I, I don't know if you could check out the issue. I think it's still open on, so we look for it on event budget, and yeah, issues. Yeah, the one Berlin was what, yeah, that one. Let me scroll, there's a comment. So if you see the first, I think, yeah, this one. So yeah, I, I, I haven't done a check if the, the form fields apply to both events. I haven't like really done a check through. It's if I'm correct me if I'm wrong. I'm sorry we're over time. If you need to drop off, please feel free. But um, it seems like the in-person events have higher expectations. Is that right? From a badging perspective, with respect to metrics, or is that not right? I think yeah, it's right. High expectations, yeah. So I'm wondering if it's a hybrid, at least for now, we would ask them to go through the in-person process just because they will have in-person people in a hybrid event. And that's the one that has the higher expectations. Yeah, I, I agree with that. And, and actually, uh, I think in the future, uh, as we, I think these these hybrid events become really become part of the the inclusion of the event itself. Uh, so if it is an in person event, uh, it's going to be more inclusive if there's a virtual component to it as well. So that may be that may be something we want to look at in the future for in person events as well, where we where we start to expect all in person events to have some sort of virtual or hybrid component. That's a good point. So Ruth, I think this is the proper application. That would be my take. I don't know. I agree. And is that okay, Ruth? You think that's? Yeah, yeah, that's fine. I think maybe we might want to indicate maybe on the website that. Yeah, I or... think so too. 
But like if you're at a hybrid event, please use the in-person yeah. um, approach. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you, everybody. Um, till next time. Sorry, we're six minutes over. Got a lot of good progress on the badging. So thank you very much for that. And metrics. So, all right. Have a good day. Talk to you later. Bye, yeah. girl. Thank you.